Uh, good morning and welcome to the press conference for the 54th annual meeting of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. I'm Robin Cohen, Chair of the Workforce for Media Relations and Communication. Our next paper to be discussed this morning is entitled One in Seven Lung Surgery Patients at Risk for Opioid Dependence and will be delivered by Dr. Alexander Brescia from the University of Michigan. Dr. Brescia. Thank you for this opportunity to present today at the uh, STS press conference. Drug overdose deaths climbed to over 63,000 in 2016. The age-adjusted rate of overdoses was 21 percent higher in 2016 than a year prior and greater than 300 times the rate it was in 1999. This is a graphic from the New York Times that illustrates the magnitude of annual drug overdoses in the U.S. As you can see, the figure of greater than 63,000 in 2016 is well above the uh, figure of peak HIV deaths in 1995. Opioid dependence, misuse, and abuse in the U.S. has continued to rise. Americans consume more opioids than any other country and have the highest rate of drug-related deaths in the world. This graphic shows the increase in drug overdose deaths in the United States by geography, beginning in 2003 and progressing through 2014. As shown, the increase in the overdose has been concentrated in Appalachia and the southwestern United States. Overdoses specifically from opioids have increased 500% from 1999 to 2016. Much of this has been driven by prescription opioids. In addition to the addiction and mortality caused by this epidemic, the estimated cost of prescription opioid overdoses, abuse, and dependence has exceeded $78.5 billion in an analysis done in 2013. Because of the extensive morbidity, mortality, and cost of this epidemic, the role of surgeons has come under increased scrutiny. One pathway to patients developing opioid dependence begins with opioid usage following surgery. In conjunction with the increased rates of overdoses and increase in costs related to the epidemic since 1999, we've also seen a more than triple times increase in the amount of opioids prescribed per person in the U.S., from 180 morphine equivalents in 1999 to 640 morphine milligram equivalents in 2015. It's also important to understand that persistently taking opioids not only puts patients at risk for harmful effects of prescription pills, but also puts them at risk for abusing other drugs, as 80 percent of new heroin users reported some point in time previously misusing prescription opioid medication. Some patients who did not take opioids pri prior to surgery and are what we call opioid naive use opioids to manage pain after surgery and continue to use them thereafter. Prior studies documented this persistent use to occur in 3 to 8 percent of patients following minor and major elective operations and in approximately 10 percent of early, can early stage cancer patients undergoing curative resection. Currently, there's limited data on new persistent opioid usage in thoracic oncology patients. Our objectives were first to define the incidence of new persistent opioid usage among opioid-naive patients undergoing lung resection in the United States. Second, we aim to explore risk factors for new persistent opioid usage following lung resection. Our hypotheses were first that the rate of new persistent opioid use after lung resection would compare to that of other cancer patients in the United States. Second, we hypothesized that the risk factors for persistent opioid usage may include surgical approach in addition to the established risk factors. I would like to briefly define three key terms that we used in our study. Opioid naive describes patients without a prescription filled between 12 months and 31 days prior to surgery. A 30-day window is allowed because some surgical practices preoperatively prescribe opioids to be used postoperatively after an operation. 
Second, prescriptions were attributed to the surgical operation were defined as those filled between 30 days prior to surgery and 14 days after, dis after discharge from the hospital. Third is our primary outcome, new persistent opioid usage, which describes opioid naive patients who filled an initial prescription attributed to surgery, then filled at least one additional prescription between 90 and 180 days following surgery. Our data was drawn from insurance claims from the Truven Health Market Scan Research databases, which incorporate over 100 employer-based private types of insurance across the country. We included adults who underwent curative intent resection of lung cancer between the beginning of 2010 and the middle of 2014. These patients were all opioid naive, filled a prescription attributed to the operation, and were continuously enrolled in insurance for one year, both before and after surgery. Patients who remain in the hospital beyond 30 days or underwent a subsequent procedure within 180 days of their index hospitalization, of their index operation, were excluded, as were home hospice patients and patients that died during the index hospitalization. This table describes our patient population. Mean age was 64. Almost a third of patients had a diagnosis of anxiety, depression, or substance abuse. Only 6.5% underwent neoadjuvant therapy prior to surgery, while nearly 22% underwent either chemotherapy or radiation after surgery. For both neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy, there was an approximate 4 to 1 ratio between the number of patients that underwent chemotherapy versus radiation therapy. 57% of patients underwent thoracotomy, while 41% underwent a minimally invasive VATS approach. Mean length of stay was just over five days. Median opioid prescription was 315 morphine equivalents, which equals 63 pills of 5 milligram hydrocodone or 45 pills of 5 milligram oxycodone. Overall, 14% of patients continued to fill opioid prescriptions three to six months following surgery. Among the 1,722 who underwent thoracotomy, 17.1% of them persistently used opioids as compared to 9.4% the, of the VATS patients. 23.9% of those who underwent adjuvant therapy persistently used opioids compared to 11.4% of those patients who did not undergo adjuvant therapy. In univariate analysis, a number of risk factors were found to be associated with persistent opioid use. Age of 64 or younger, male sex, income of less than $70,000, and a history of substance abuse were all associated with a higher risk of persistent opioid usage. In addition, Surgical approach to a thoracotomy, post-operative stay in the hospital greater than five days, and undergoing adjuvant therapy were all associated with a higher risk of persistent usage. These variables were included in a multivariable regression model, which indicated that income and substance abuse were not independent risk factors for persistent opioid usage, while the remaining five factors were. This force plot shows that adjuvant therapy and thoracotomy were the two strongest independent risk factors for persistent opioid usage in this population. A major area of investigation in combating the opioid epidemic is determining optimal guidelines for acute prescribing after surgery. Members of our group at Michigan investigated this after gallbladder surgery, and their results are shown here. The left side of the figure shows the median number of pills prescribed after cholecystectomy prior to their intervention, which was 45 pills of hydrocodone. The right side shows the amount prescribed after they implemented these new guidelines, which decreased to a median of 15 pills. This study and the results have contributed to evidence-based prescribing guidelines, patient education, and a wide-reaching effort to promote proper disposal of excess opioids and decreasing opioid diversion in Michigan through an organization called the Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network, or Michigan Open. The guidelines seen here for common general surgery procedures were developed from patient surveys comparing the amount of opioids consumed to the amount prescribed, 
identifying the 66th percentile of median or morphine equivalents consumed by surveyed patients. These guidelines are currently being implemented at the University of Michigan. While no guidelines currently exist for general thoracic or cardiac surgical procedures, this is an area of future study. Michigan open guidelines do not solely focus on prescribing, but also stress patient education and counseling. The following are a set of standardized statements used for patient education. For example, setting expectations, setting norms to provide patients with a metric for what's normal, counseling patients about non-opioid options that can help manage pain, stressing that the only purpose of the opioids is for surgical pain, explaining the potential adverse effects of these medications, and importantly, advising about safe methods of disposal. Limitations to our study include use of an employer-based insurance claims database, which may not represent a generalizable population. Additionally, we report up to six-month follow-up and do not, upset, do not assess chronic opioid usage beyond this six-month period. Finally, we do not have information on cancer staging, which may be a confounding factor in our results. In conclusion, the rate of new persistent opioid usage following lung resection was higher than published rates for minor and major procedures in both cancer and non-cancer patients. The two most significant risk factors for new persistent opioid usage were adjuvant therapy and thoracotomy. New persistent opioid uses usage is an iatrogenic post-operative complication which matches or exceeds the prevalence of atrial fibrillation. Future areas of investigation include incorporating risk factors for persistent usage into the development and implementation of evidence-based prescribing guidelines and improved patient education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brescia. I want to introduce Dr. David Cook from UC Davis in Sacramento to discuss the paper. Thank you, Dr. Brescia. Uh, this is a, an excellent study uh, that you and your colleagues at the University of Michigan have performed. Uh, University of Michigan are, are leaders in the um, awareness, uh, approach, and understanding of the role of opioids and um, uh, treatment of pain using opioids in the surgical specialty. So I'd like to compliment your group on, on, what, on what you have done. Uh, as you pointed out, we are in the midst of an opioid epidemic in the United States. There are more deaths than, uh, from, from drug overdose in the United States than uh, peak deaths for HIV and peak deaths for gun violence in the United States. That's uh, more deaths for drug overdose. When you do a deeper dive and, and determine what types of drugs are responsible for those deaths, narcotics and opioids, um, it's, it's a high uh, uh, responsibility for that. The lion's share being heroin and fentanyl, um, but a significant number of those deaths are related to, to prescription uh, opioids and also a combination of prescription opioids and fentanyl. Now, epidemics do not discriminate. The, the majority of deaths from opioid-related drug overdose are in uh, populations such as the white community and Native American communities. But we found in the last couple years a spike, an acceleration of deaths um, from opioid drug overdose uh, in the African American community and the Hispanic community as well. So this is an epidemic that crosses all aspects of our society. Now, what is the role of surgery in, uh, in the opioid epidemic? 75% of heroin users um, encountered opioids through prescription drugs, uh, prescription opioids. Now, that doesn't all uh, mean surgery, um, but it's an aspect of our healthcare. When you look at surgery specifically, Post-operative pain after surgery, specifically lung surgery, uh, can be a problem. The, the incidence of post-thoracotomy pain syndrome, by definition, post-thoracotomy pain syndrome is pain along the incision sites, whether it's open or minimally invasively, two months after the surgical procedure. 
the incidence of postoperative pain syndrome is anywhere between 10 and 60 percent. So, but it may be an underreported problem. Our patients may not be telling us that they have these pain issues. A Canadian study looked at the prescription rates of opioids postoperatively. And what they found was data similar to Brush's, uh, Dr. Brush's group at the University of Michigan. They found that thoracotomy and minimally invasive surgery for thoracic surgery had a higher incidence of continued opioid prescription rates at 180 days and longer than other major types of surgery. So thoracic surgery specifically has a, uh, a challenge when it comes to the optimal management of pain. But just as, cardi just as cardiovascular disease and cancer, specifically lung cancer, are the number one killers in the United States, thoracic surgeons have played a leadership role in turning patients with those disease processes into survivors. And Dr. Brush's group is the opening salvo of our thoracic surgical community to take control of this situation and play, play a leadership role. Key components of uh, Dr. Brush's uh, study is that they analyzed the Chubin Health Market Scan um, database. As they pointed out, this is a database looking at private insurance claims. So this really gives us a, a good impression of what's going on in the surgical community. It doesn't take into account Medicare or um, uh, Medicaid uh, uh, recipients who undergo surgery, but that would be the sort of the next step in the analysis um, in terms of regards of, of, of this problem. And what they found was that 14% of patients undergoing lung cancer surgery in their population um, had opioid prescriptions at six months. Now, it doesn't determine if they're using those prescriptions, right. but it does show that they are actively seeking out those prescriptions, and our, our assumption would be that they are, are using that medication, and their assumption is that they are in some sort of pain. And that they filled that second prescription. Correct. Now, there are some interesting points to this. One is, now, 17% of the thoracotomy patients, a thoracotomy is a, a cut in the chest that involves spreading the ribs and does not involve a camera to, to look at the inside of the body. 70% of those patients were filling prescriptions for, op for opioids. Mm -hmm. Now, of the minimally invasive, uh, the patients undergoing minimally invasive surgery, that includes video-assisted thoracic surgery, so small, generally small incisions, and using a high-definition camera and not spreading the ribs in order to do surgery, the rate of opioid prescription at, at six months was 9%. Now, again, that's almost half of the thoracotomy approach, so that's the glass half full. But the glass half empty is, it's still 9%, and it's still higher than published data for other types of surgery. So there's room for improvement. But there is also a very interesting aspect in regards to the demographics of the patients that you identified in your study. About one third of the patients had issues with anxiety. And what we do know is that the psychosocial stressors of a cancer diagnosis can affect a patient's perception of pain. So this ident identifies an opportunity for improvement for thoracic surgeons to help our patients. Looking at this data, we would say that perhaps we should, uh, in the preoperative phase, bring in assistance and help for our patients with these psychosocial stressors. And perhaps not only would that help them from their mental status standpoint, but also help us to deal with the pain that they perceive at the perioperative and postoperative level. The second demographic that you identified uh, uh, in your study was the high prevalence of substance abuse uh, in this patient population. Again, an opportunity for thoracic surgeons to be leaders to help our patients identify those patients who have uh, those uh, uh, predilection to substance abuse and then um, provide them the help that they need um, um, to, to put them in a better situation and, again, help them with their pain perception. Now, when you, when you looked at your multivariate analysis, what you found was that adjuvant therapy <clears throat> and thoracotomy uh, were independent risk factors for 
uh, continued prescription use at six months. Uh, again, an opportunity. And it makes us think, of, think about how we approach our practice. Now, thoracotomy is the standard of care for, for lung cancer surgery, just as an open uh, fundoplication is the standard of care for, uh, an, for, uh, for surgical uh, approach for acid reflux. But if a, th a thoracic surgeon has the ability to perform minimally invasive surgery, if at all possible, perhaps that approach should be prioritized for their patient to minimize their risk for, for, for opioid dependence uh, at six months and longer. So in summary, again, we are in the midst of an opioid epidemic. But within crisis, there comes opportunity for change. Just as we were in the midst of a cardiovascular disease epidemic, and just as we are in the midst of a lung cancer uh, epidemic, thoracic surgeons provide leadership and the ability to restore health for our patients. And this is another opportunity where we could become leaders. Thank you for Dr. Brush, Dr. Brescia for opening our eyes uh, to this uh, serious problem. Very good, thank you very much. I also want to point out that we have two renowned thoracic surgeons in the room, Dr. Keith Nonheim, who is the president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and Dr. Mark Allen, who was a previous president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons from the Mayo Clinic. Would either of you like to make a comment or are there are questions for them regarding this topic? Since you used your um, database just for patients with employer or pride and um, employer provided insurance. Do you think there are, you left out a big group of patients that are on Medicare or Medicaid that uh, seems to me have a bigger problem with opioid addiction? Thank you, Dr. Allen, for the question. I think that's a great point. I think there are probably some patients that qualify for Medicare and use private insurance, but regardless, I think they're like you said, there's definitely a huge group of patients, especially Medicaid patients and Medicare patients, who are unaccounted for in our study, but are definitely an area that uh, should be investigated going forward. Uh, uh, Ed Sussman with Doctor's Guide. Um, I'm a little concerned that we are uh, not taking a closer look at the pain that the people are in that may that be taking these drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, your your two groups that have that you identified as having, uh, or who will be on taking the prescriptions longer, are those who had a thoracotomy, and who have adjuvant therapy, which would indicate these are sicker people, have probably have larger cancers, and uh, probably larger surgeries. And it would just sort of stand to reason that these people might have longer pain. Um, is that true? Am I missing something? Am I, am I, I think that, uh, so thank you for the question. One, one aspect of, one of the limitations I mentioned is we don't control for cancer stage. I think that the short answer is that may be true, but we're not sure. And what I mean by that is I think depending on the practice, some, some places doing a thoracotomy is practice-based as opposed to cancer-based. That being said, other places that practice both approaches it may be a more advanced cancer that they approach with a thoracotomy. So I think, I think that control, one way to do that would be to control for the stage of cancer, which we weren't able to do. That being said, I don't know, that, I don't believe that it's been established that that would be uh, what we would find. Um, and another thing that just sure. made me wonder when you were giving the uh, example, why is Appalachia and the Southwest um, have greater incidence of, uh, of, of uh, problems with opioids? I, I think that's an excellent question. I, I do not know. Uh, so if you look at the baseline, you've got 17% substance abusers mm -hmm. to start with, mm -hmm. and you have 17% afterwards. Are they the same patients? While I don't know if those are the same patients, I think that's a great question. I think the way that we accounted for 
that being a confounding factor is by adding it to our multivariable model. And we actually didn't find that substance abuse was a, a risk factor that predicted persistent usage. So while I don't know the patient to patient, whether it matches up, I think we, the way that we accounted for that is by including substance abuse as one of our factors in the model. Um, maybe I don't understand, but if, if you didn't increase the rate, if you had 17% going in and you had 17% coming out, doesn't look like the surgery really made a difference. Well, I think, I think it's not exactly apples to apples because one is having a history of substance abuse, which is not necessarily pertaining to opioids, and then the other is people who did not use opioids who now do. I had uh, one other question. Six, y y your data ba is based on six months of uh, filling prescriptions. Mm -hmm. When does, you know, can you say that just because you have, um, you you're using o opioid prescriptions for six months that you are opioid dependent? Um, you know, when, where, where's the tipping line between, that goes between using the drugs for pain and becoming addicted. Right, that's also a great question. I think that as Dr. Cohen said at the beginning, our conclusion of what we're saying, one in seven patients are at risk for opioid dependence. And I think that's really important. We're not saying these people are addicted to opioids. We're not saying even necessarily they're dependent on them, but by using, by filling that second prescription and using opioids in that period, three to six months after surgery, that puts them at risk for dependence because whether it's through minimally invasive, whether it's through a thoracotomy, I think the uh, statement is that as thoracic surgeons, we would expect them to be healed from their operation. They should not still be using it in that period, regardless of approach. If they're not using it for the surgery, could they still be using it for the cancer, though? I mean, you've you Absolutely. haven't cured them. And right. what is the life expectancy of, of a typical thoracotomy patient? I mean, so do we really care if they become addicted? If they've got a, 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 a survival of sure. three years, do I care? No, my father-in-law won't take an opioid when he needs it because so, he's 94. He's afraid he's going to get sure. addicted. Okay, so thank you for that question also. Um, I'll sort of take that. <laughs> I think... I think one important point that you touched on is that while we found adjuvant therapy was a risk factor, neoadjuvant therapy was not. So there's been published a certain, uh, especially with chemotherapy, there's a neurotoxicity associated with that, which leads to persistent usage. People who undergo definitive chemotherapy, a third of them are persistent opioid users. So yes, there is a risk from the therapy itself, but I think it's it's a key point that we found that patients that had therapy prior to surgery was not a risk factor for persistent usage, whereas after surgery is. So there's likely some sort of additive effect or synergy with receiving therapy on top of the morbidity, uh, both psychological and physical, of surgery. Uh, but uh, in terms of, I mean, well, I think that's a difficult. It, 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 I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, you know, there's, I, I don't think you're going to have one, uh, one single answer that uh, uh, will apply to all patients. We, as, just like you, we always individualize our treatment to the patient. Uh, my father is, is 94 as well, and if he, he wants to have uh, uh, three shots of bourbon a night, God bless him, he can have three shots of bourbon a night. Uh, maybe not good for him, but who the hell cares? Uh, but most of our patients aren't that age, and most of our patients uh, uh, are in there. The median, median age for the onset of lung cancer is 70 years. So we have a lot of people in their 60s and a lot of people in their 70s. Um, you asked about the, the survival for people after a thoracotomy. It is stage dependent. Most of the people we do thoracotomies on, the vast majority are stage one, and stage one has a 60 to 70 percent five-year survival. We got a shot at these people living a long time, and we don't want them living addicted to opioids. 
I will first say that what he probably said, and I'm sorry before I came in, the thoracotomy incision is probably the most painful incision you can make on the human body. Dr. Allen, am I overstating that? No, it, it is. We, 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 not only, we not only cut the muscles, we not only stretch the tendons, we compress nerves uh, and we, we inflame this pleural surface, which is, which is very, very sensitive. It is as painful an incision as you can make anywhere. Thoracic surgery as a whole for many years has been working uh, through uh, phase after phase, trying to find the answer to that. But we, like everybody else, were, have been caught a little flat-footed by this tremendous explosion over the past three years of opioid deaths. We always knew it was going on. America always knew it was going on. But suddenly, when it exceeds the number of gun violence deaths, it is just, it's become to be recognized as an epidemic. I would love to tell you we recognized it three years ago. We didn't. We, like the rest of America, recognized it when, when the media, when the press made everybody aware of it. That being said, we are now pledged as a society to, as, as David Cook said, to address this. We recognize this is a danger to our patients, uh, and there are uh, not only uh, 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 there are issues being brought up at this meeting, and there are uh, different uh, uh, presentations being made. There's an ERAS presentation, a way to, that we manage post-operative care, get them out of the hospital earlier. We have the, uh, a panel, a video roundtable on opioids. We are going to do our very best to educate our membership and to educate the public about these dangers and to prevent that from happening. Um, I would love to tell you we can, we'll solve this problem in the next year. We like to solve problems, right? We say somebody comes in lung cancer, take out the lung cancer, mm, good, we've done the job. It's not gonna be that easy, uh, but we as a society are uh, dedicated to addressing this problem, and I think we can make it better. Um, I'm hoping we can knock that down from 14% down to 5% uh, or even less. We will not extinguish the problem, but we will do our very best to, to, to drive it as, uh, to as low an incidence as possible. If I can ask two questions. So given all of this, should thoracic surgeons, are, are they obligated to mention potential opioid dependence as a risk factor for a lung cancer operation? And secondly, can you mention some strategies, um, whether it be other medications, intercostal blocks, that thoracic surgeons are using to specifically prevent long-term opioid use in patients undergoing lung cancer operations? Sure. Thank you for those two questions. I think your first question and the answer is absolutely. And, I, and that was one of, uh, one of my conclusions using the terminology iatrogenic complication. I think... I think there needs to be a shift in thinking where this is a complication from surgery. And it's not something that's separate from surgery that we can't really control. And like Dr. Nonheim said, it doesn't mean we're going to wipe it out, but I think that the role of surgeons is much bigger than it has been treated as. And then your second question, I think especially for thoracic surgery, it's definitely a uh, significant topic right now. A lot of centers do different types of nerve blocks, whether that is a cryo block where they freeze the intercostal nerves or they, uh, probably many more centers than that, inject bupivacaine. And then most recently, liposomal bupivacaine has become a common topic. It is more expensive than bupivacaine, but it, it has been shown to last much longer. That being said, in the setting of thoracic surgery and controlling pain and decreasing opioid usage, the evidence is not robust enough at this point where it will necessarily be approved to be used everywhere. At our center, we use regular bupivacaine and do a post-operative block uh, under direct vision, but part of that is because we're still working out with a pain management team whether we can get liposomal bupivacaine approved. And like I said, there hasn't been significant research within thoracic surgery. There are some being done now. There has been research in orthopedic surgery. And the one concern with liposomal bupivacaine is that it controls the pain immediately post-operative, but then pain may come back a number of days down the line. That being said, the research that has been done is promising, uh, like Dr. Nonheim said, with some of the ERAS protocols, and we'll see what that shows.
And there are some other uh, that there are some other agents that have been used. Some people use round the clock, beginning from the very beginning. They start I intraoperatively. They'll start an anti-inflammatory. The most common one to be used is uh, uh, ketorolac. Uh, gabapentin, which is sort of a nerve deadener, is uh, has been started uh, preoperatively, round the clock Tylenol. The whole idea is to attack the pain from as many different pathways as possible, trying to minimize the the utilization of opioids. If you're asking me, will opioids still be used? Honestly, unless we want to leave them in agony, yeah, we, we, we do have to use that. We're, and we're not, we're not in this business to torture people. We cannot have people uh, uh, crying out in pain in their hospital beds. So it will be used, but perhaps if we can use it more judiciously, uh, more conservatively, by utilizing these other methodologies, we can help staunch this uh, epidemic. I think, I think it's also really important what Dr. Nanam said about the adjunct medications, and gabapentin is an example of a medication that's used to treat neuropathic pain. And I think that a key point is that pain from a thoracotomy has been shown to not necessarily be well treated with opioids. So on top of using a, a significant amount of opioids, it doesn't necessarily treat this type of pain, and other adjunctive medications such as gabapentin are, have been shown to be more fit to treat neuropathic pain. You're, you're not taking the approach that um, orthopedics um, has taken. We're at the orthopedics meeting last year. Uh, they had a panel for reporters, and one of the officials has basically said, you know what, they can just suffer for 24 hours. It's only 24 hours. We just tell them, you know, no, we're not giving you anything. You just Those bastards. go through it. How dare they? And I'm like, really? <laughs> That you really are saying that? Yes, that's I, what they I said. Think, I think uh, there's a big difference really? between a thoracotomy and an orthopedic procedure, yeah. and well, for a thoracotomy, yeah. after the 24 hours, the pain won't go away. So <laughs> you do a thoracotomy on an orthopod, they'll be crying like a little baby. They'll be, they'll be begging you for opioids. Oh, yeah. Give me a call. We'll, we'll, we'll make certain you get no pain medication. Uh, also, thinking about the, the fact that you, the neoadjuvant patients do not seem to be a, at risk of um, continued opioid use, sure. but um, adjuvant therapy patients are, is there a possibility that the uh, combination of opioids and the adjuvant therapy is um, making pain persist in some manner? I think that's a great question and a great point. I think it's, it's definitely a possibility. And like I said, that difference between adjuvant being significant and not neoadjuvant opens up a number of other doors into investigating why that is and what the interactions are between surgery, adjuvant therapy, adjuvant therapy, opioids, like you said. Uh, and I think that should be a, something that we look into going forward.